Meredith Edwards is Emeritus Professor at the Anzog Institute for Governance at the University of Canberra. She's an economist who has spent her career as an academic, a researcher, a policy analyst, and also a senior executive in government and in the university sector. From 1983 to 1997, she played a central role in many of the Commonwealth government's most significant policy innovations. This included Oz Study, the development of HEX, and the subject of this talking head, the Child Support Scheme. Meredith has been a, a policy advisor on many of the key Commonwealth issues of the past three decades, including in the role as, de as Deputy Secretary in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet from 1993. Um, she also served as Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University of Canberra from 1997 to 2002 and she set up the National Institute for Governance here in 1999 which she led until 2004. Um, much um, of the documented um, evidence regarding Meredith's work in social policy can be found in her wonderful book Social Policy, Public Policy from Problem to Practice which is based upon um, case studies in policy innovation, one of which we're going to be looking at today. Um, she was also appointed to the United Nations Committee of Experts on Public Administration in 2010. Meredith, thank you very much for coming to talk to us here today about the birth of the Child Support Scheme in Australia. Could you provide us with a picture of the policy environment um, in which the Child Support Scheme emerged? Child Support uh, emerged in a period which was for it ripe for reform. It was the right time. At that time um, the government was really keen to get revenue, to get rid of its deficit. It had had some attempts at doing a uh, reform child maintenance, it was called then, child maintenance scheme, which had failed. So um, uh, with the aim of wanting revenue in the mid-1980s to get rid of the deficit and with a minister Brian Howe, Minister for Social Security, interested in getting uh, the poverty of sole parents um, on the agenda, which was an issue also at the time, you could say the political environment was right for change. I think one of the, um, one of the strong points in favour of reform was that child support uh, was easy to see as a problem. Why should, uh, why should um, the taxpayer pay just because parents decide they're not going to live with their children. Uh, why should children suffer? It was easy to define the problem, it was easy to articulate it and I think that's what, uh, that's what uh, helped get the reform on the agenda. What were you asked to do? Um, well I was a member of the Family Law Council at the time and with a couple of members of that council uh, we'd produced a paper which had an innovative idea in it about uh, using the tax system to assess and collect the child support payments. And uh, Brian Howe, who was the Minister for Social Security, actually saw that paper and he liked the idea in it. He thought that he could convince other ministers of, of going ahead with this particular uh, proposal for reform, so he asked me to be his ministerial advisor, uh, which I did, and so I went and worked for him uh, from the beginning of 1986. Could you now describe the process of learning from ideas to action? There are a number of elements here. First of all, as I mentioned, the Family Law Council was quite an influential non-government organisation that uh, was pushing this reform, uh, and it with a with a novel idea. Also, I think that what this, as well as other reforms uh, indicate, is the importance of the role of research. In this case, uh, a particular overseas academic from the University of Wisconsin, Professor Irv Garfinkel, had, was trying uh, with a pilot program in his state of Wisconsin to uh, uh, bring in a reform based on the tax system. So that he came to Australia at a critical time and was able to convince ministers of, uh, of this particular uh, way of, of, of undertaking reform. Um, and what we did in the Family Law Council and later on in papers we wrote was adapt that particular proposal in Wisconsin for the Australian scene. Uh, but also, um, as I said, the political environment was favourable, so that was, that was a factor. And uh, I was also able, fortunately, uh, 
to take time out at the ANU for six months and I decided having seen in government the failed previous attempts that I wanted to work on this. So being able to get time to delve into the issues deeply was, I think, a pretty critical factor. Apart from that, once the policy process started, it was a very comprehensive process. It was systematic. Uh, and I think that going through all the major stages in a policy process was necessary for such a complex reform. Why do you think you were chosen for this role? Well, I think I was known by then as a policy activist or entrepreneur. I had spent a couple of years working on simplifying the youth income support system. And as I said, I was on the Family uh, Law Council where I was mainly responsible for this idea of using the tax office uh, as a key part of um, assessing and collecting maintenance. Um, and then I had that time out at the ANU uh, on this topic and Brian Howe, the uh, relevant minister, was aware of the work that I was doing and so I think that was the reason I was asked to come into, to, back to government to work on this particular project. What resources helped you to develop these ideas? Well, several. Uh, to begin with, I guess, having that time out in a research environment to think, uh, you could call thought leadership. I could delve into issues uh, that would inevitably come up in a policy process. Uh, secondly, I think uh, having access to uh, a reputable researcher in uh, Irv Garfinkel uh, and just generally um, uh, having his ideas go to decision makers but using, I guess, um, uh, whatever research had been done around this topic I think was pretty important. The political support that I had from um, Minister Howe and uh, the way he was able to get a net network of key ministers around him wanting this reform. Um, another factor was the continuity of personnel and the building up of trust. Um, uh, I can recall Mike Keating, who I'd known from a previous chapter in my life in the Department of Finance, keen about this reform and telling his staff, including Bill Burmester, to work uh, cooperatively with, uh, with me and my team, as well as over in Prime Minister and Cabinet, I knew Mariana Lachlan was also a keen supporter of this sort of reform. So having that network was important. And finally, I can't emphasise enough the, the, str the strategic learning I got in policy processes, particularly this one, of putting uh, value issues before ministers first to get them to make the hard decisions that mm. bureaucrats could not resolve, and then, only then, coming forward with relevant options. What do you think were the, the critical elements determining, determining the success of this policy process? In terms of um, the policy process, I think I was lucky to be a ministerial advisor working inside the bureaucracy inside the Social Security Department. I think that gave me some freedom working directly to the Minister but being able to harness the bureaucracy at the same time. So it was a degree of freedom there that you don't normally have as a public servant. Uh, secondly, uh, I uh, partly related, I was given freedom to recruit people I wanted and I brought in three brilliant lawyers from outside of government who knew about child support but they knew nothing about the bureaucracy but they had the ideas that were needed to push this forward. Mm. Um, so I could recruit people I wanted. Um, I think also um, was the uh, going through uh, all the stages in the policy process, having time to do that and using research because people were so cynical about the, this scheme succeeding that you needed to be able to say, well, this is what the effect will be. Um, also getting um, ministers, as I said, to come up with the key principles of the scheme based on a set of values, key principles, uh, like using the tax office, an administrative scheme, before uh, coming through with more detailed uh, options. And I think just Generally, Mark, we, it wasn't just about having a comprehensive policy process, it was also about uh, having the politics, the processes and the players all aligned with a good policy process. So I think that was a, a very, very fortunate because mm. the scheme was so complex. Would you like to elaborate on that last point? 
In terms of the politics, we had ministers who were keen to find savings but also assist sole parents uh, who were known to, to uh, need extra support. So the political environment was, was, uh, was good. Uh, and we also had ministers, fortunately, who were prepared to meet regularly. They were meeting sometimes every week in a subcommittee to get the decisions which they got within uh, a few months. Uh, also, I think um, when the scheme was seen at one stage as too radical to go ahead in one stage, it was the flexibility then to um, adapt the, the, the reform to two stages, to break it in two, so that um, the pace was more in tune mm -hmm. with what people could accept. Uh, in terms of process, as I mentioned, the unusual at that time, rather novel way of using a ministerial advisor with a group of contacts, not the traditional IDC, which would not have worked. The contacts were more focused uh, on, on problem solving than they were with their individual interests to, to some extent, but also I had more influence with ministers knowing where the contacts were coming from. Um, and um, I think another factor which Bill might like to talk about um, is that we got the Department of Finance involved early in agreeing our assumptions and then we could share our costings as the process developed without having to have the argy-bargy around costings mm. between a line department and finance uh, at the last stage. But also though uh, I think you have to mention the players were pretty significant, uh, a network of players who knew each other because there were lobby groups out there in opposing this scheme quite vehemently uh, and uh, the, the, one of the skills of the minister was to get some of them on side and co-opt mm -hmm. them in, into the processes. Um, having outsiders like the lawyers I mentioned coming in and with innovative solutions pitched against uh, public servants who kept saying that it won't work. Um, and I think having the, the leadership of a strategically focused minister and other ministers. But that's not to say it was easy. There were many obstacles uh, uh, to this scheme being significant uh, because a lot of the bureaucracy wasn't very convinced that it would happen. There were no lobby groups supporting uh, the scheme and we had no models really to, to focus on overseas. Were there any un unintended consequences of action? Uh, I think one was um, the, um, that the, because the uh, scheme was so radical, it had to be divided up into two stages. The, the media basically, I should have mentioned them as a player, they were base, basically on side, but there was a key article that came out at one stage in the Financial Review that said there were some unintended consequences here, mm. which there would be. And so uh, the unintended consequence for us was that we had to break the scheme up into two and do, do some more work before the second stage could come in. Mm -hmm. So that was one. And I think uh, a second one was we didn't understand, not for want of trying, the culture of the tax office. And had we knew more what was driving them, then I think we might have uh, wouldn't have had so many hurdles. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, I think a good unintended unintended co consequence was when the higher education contribution scheme was being formulated. The tax office then was far less resistant to taking on social policy reform, having just done child support. How important do you think the evidence was that you developed from overseas? Critical. Uh, I have mentioned uh, Irv Garfinkel and he was a researcher at the Institute for Poverty at Wisconsin. Uh, but closely tied in in various ways with the, uh, the, his uh, state uh, government uh, and he had been piloting a scheme, was intending to pilot a scheme there and had started piloting, actually didn't finish. So the irony is that we got one and, and he didn't. But he knew a lot about the relevant research on the costs of children. Uh, he had um, his own methodology around working out costs we knew of an alternative um, costing methodology that was um, in the um, uh, in another state in, in in America, and we went and in, interrogated the person there. So you actually went overseas. Yes, we went over. I went overseas, um, and uh, I, um, 
and, and, and visited several places in America in particular. Uh, my staff then followed and went later and, uh, and uh, interrogated further. For example, one of the fears was uh, that um, custodial parents wouldn't nominate the father because uh, they might, um, uh, the father might not pay and might just harass them. So we needed evidence about what the likelihood of that was going to be. So, mm -hmm. and we found that it was relatively small. Or, you know, what about the teenage guy and what, what should we do about him who had a one night mm. stand? Those sorts of things. We gathered evidence, from, particularly from states in America, which mm. when they had various forms of child support, um, mainly using the court system, but they had been much harsher in, their, in the, the way in which they were gaining the, the dollars than we had been in Australia. There was no one scheme, though, that was using the tax office. That was the novel part. We, I was also interested in what was happening in Scandinavia because they guaranteed sole parents who didn't have a, a non-custodial parent who could pay a guaranteed maintenance payment. And for me, that was a very, uh, very a central part of the scheme originally. Mm. Um, and if we could have, we would have put that into our scheme. Mm. But um, well, the evidence was there that it was mm. a good thing to do, but it, as it turned out, our scheme as modified mm. didn't include that element. We were collecting data all the time on the costs of children and on, on what proportion of non-custodial parents would pay. We used ABS data in Australia for that. Um, there was also a trip overseas to, or just to New Zealand because they had a, 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 a liable contribution scheme that uh, the non-custodial parents paid into. And I went with Brian Howe, and I remember him coming back on the plane. He was quite disappointed at their collection rate because they did it through their Department of Social Security. Mm -hmm. And he said, we've got to do it through the tax system mm -hmm. because that's a superior collection agency. Mm -hmm. How did you ensure that the evidence was culturally compatible? Well, we did adopt a lot, as I said, like the guaranteed maintenance payment schemes we thought were good from overseas. We had to integrate that with other parts of our system and it was very difficult to justify putting an extra payment to sole parents in there on top of what we already had because we already had a sole parent pension, mm -hmm. which they didn't have in Scandinavian countries. So it was hard to get support for that. Um, and similarly, um, in terms of whether the non, uh, sorry, the custodial parent should pay anything, depending on her income, uh, arguments were given to us overseas as to why that shouldn't be the case because of the time used to look after children. But in our case, uh, in particular after consultation, it was very clear we would not get the scheme up if we didn't also put uh, a responsibility on the custodial parent uh, to contribute something or have the uh, non-custodial parents contribution down because of the income of the custodial parent. Mm -hmm. So there were ways, uh, mainly out of the, through the consultation process, that we modified ideas that we would have otherwise adopted from overseas. And mm -hmm. the final one I can remember that was quite important was we got the evidence overseas on the costs of children, uh, mm -hmm. one child, two child, three child, but we modified that down in Australia because we decided, not so much because the, our costs were different, but we needed to be conservative in our estimates to mm. ensure its success. How long did the whole process take? Well, it depends where you start the process, of course. Mm. But in terms of the time in the bureaucracy, from the time that I was employed in Social Security uh, at the beginning of, uh, say, February uh, 1986, to when the main principles of the scheme were brought in, were agreed by the subcommittee, that was three months. And the cabinet had approved it within, by the June of that year. So that was very quick. But in terms of getting the scheme up through the various hurdles I've mentioned and into implementation, it was more like two years. If the process had been fast-tracked to say three months, would you have been able to have got this scheme up? Well, first of all, you wouldn't have had time to do the research, especially the overseas work we did on the cost mm. of children. Secondly, you wouldn't have had time to do the consultation that was needed uh, ongoing, but also a considered process that took a couple of months. And I think also you would have had difficulties um, refining the scheme, implementing the scheme, uh, and uh, um, um, 
I think also uh, 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 refining it over time, none of that would have been possible. With the benefit of hindsight, would you have done anything differently? Uh, yes, I would. I think in hindsight, we focused almost exclusively on the financial side of child support, uh, which was obviously going to be benefiting the, non, uh, the custodial parents, sole parents mainly, who were women. But uh, the non-custodial parents, where they had um, fair, a right to access, that that right was not enforced at the same time. And I think that, in a way, because it wasn't resolved then, did uh, contribute to some un unravelling a few years later, not in, in my view in the interest of children. Um, I would have also paid more attention to the culture of the tax office and uh, trying to find out what made them work. And I guess uh, I was a pretty, pretty new to the public service still then. And I was, um, even my minister said at times, quite intimidating. <laughs> and uh, I was sort of like a bull at the gate trying to get reform and not focusing on being more subtle in terms of using processes. So I guess now, going back and doing it again, I'm much more self-aware and hopefully that would help me. Thank you very much, Meredith. Pleasure.